Welcome to the First Customers Podcast. Today, I am honored to have Warren Gresh's on the show. He spent 30 years as a professional speaker, author, podcaster, blogger, and more. He was in inducted into the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame in 1998, and one of his books is even considered to be one of the top 10 best sales books of all time. And he even owned a minor league baseball team at one point. So, Warren, looking forward to this. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Paris. I'm very happy to be here. Let's start off by just telling us how you got your very first customer. My very first customer. Okay. This was yeah. my first, what I call, real job. You know, one where you got to wear a suit and tie. It was 1973, July of 1973. I was not quite, wow. I was about mm, three months shy of my 22nd birthday. So I was still 21 years old. I had a job working in New York City's infamous garment center. I was working for a dress manufacturing company and I was a, salesman in quotes because i was really more of a lackey slash trainee and uh every once in a while they'd let me into the showroom or whatever but i used to sit behind this desk in the front of the showroom and we had this particular company had three different divisions and in the other division that was right on the other side of our showroom they had a showroom there there was a guy who was one of the top guys in that division and he came over to me one day with a dress that he had, and he said, I want you to put this in a box. I want you to take a cab over to Diana's stores. It was a, it was a, a, a chain, big chain store at that time, probably way out of business a long time ago, like so many others. He said, I want you to take it over to this guy, the buyer, whose name I don't remember to this day, because let's, let's face it, Paris, that was 50 years ago. <laughs> He says, and he'll give you an order for 100 of them. I said, great. Okay. So I took up the box. I went over to Diana's store, stuck it all the way on the west side of Manhattan. I, I get there. I show him the dress. This is the dress. I'm supposed to pick up an order. He gives me the order. I come back. Guy approaches me again. Same guy from the other division. He happens to be the one of the one of the owners. He happens to be his stepson, one of the owner's stepsons. He comes to me with a dress. I want you to take this dress, put it in a box, go over to Diana's stores, and see the buyer, he'll give you an order for 100. I do it again, boom. A few weeks later, he comes over to me again a third time. Finally, I said to myself, the hell with this clown? I said, you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> I put his dress in the box, and I took one off of my line, and I put it in the box. And I went over to the Diana stores, and I pulled the dress out, his dress out. I said, I'm supposed to get an order for 100 of these, but I got to tell you something. I pulled my dress out. I got one here that's even better. This is the one you should buy. <laughs> Guy gives me an order for a hundred of them, of my dress, wow. not the other dress. I come back and I am on cloud nine. Now, wow. right after I come, not too long I come, my boss calls me in the office. He says, shut the door. I shut the door. He says, I'm supposed to yell at you right now, but take my credit card, go to Macy's, buy yourself a shirt and tie on me. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> That's but now awesome. you've got to understand something about my boss, Sal Russo. This guy was, he was like one of the worst bosses of all time. And, and, and he was, but I got to <laughs> tell you something. I learned more from him than anybody ever in my entire life. I learned more about sales. I learned more about business. I learned more about dealing with people. I mean, he was just a son of a bitch. I mean, he was the worst, but. And he was also cheap as hell. Yeah, you know how you say uh, he probably has every dollar he ever earned? Well, this guy yeah. took the first dollar and bought a wallet. And if he ever jumped <laughs> off his bank books, he would have broken both of his legs. So I go, I take his credit card, I go to Macy's, and I buy myself a real nice shirt and tie. He calls him in his office, he says, what the hell? You spent $30 on a shirt. Now, $30 on a shirt back in 1973 <laughs> right, was real right. money. He says, I want to see what a $30 shirt works like. looks like. I mean, this guy was so cheap. He used to wear pants that cost a dollar. He once said to me, what do you think? My wife got these pants for a buck. I said, I think someone's out a buck. So, <laughs> and so I showed him the shirt, but he, he laughed. He loved it. He loved what I did. And that's probably, I'll never forget that. The other guy wasn't too happy with me. Yeah. But what the hell did I care? I made a good sale. And that vaulted me right into the role of being a full-time salesman. Wow. So was that the other guy's dress? Was that somebody else at your company? Like another company? No, it was the same company, but a different division. A different company? 
Oh, yeah. okay. In fact, the guy who was the stepfather, okay. he heard the story. He loved it too because he was that kind of guy. <laughs> he really liked me. He was the owner of the company. In fact, the company was going through some hard times because they were owned by a bunch of, and this is the truth. You ever heard the term Philadelphia lawyers? I don't know well, that's a term for the guys that you know <laughs> crawl on their belly. These guys were actual okay. Philadelphia <laughs> lawyers, the other three guys that owned the company. And, and, and the company was in Chapter 11, and they decided they were going to cut everybody's salary 10%. I went to my boss. I said, what are you kidding me? I said, I'm making $200 a week. These guys are driving Mercedes Benzes and Rolls Royces. What are they going to do with my 20 bucks? So he said, well, talk to Jack, who was the, the owner. Wasn't the, he was the only one that was a dress person. He was the owner, though. I went into him. And I was the only one who ever complained. And I went into him and said, Jack, come on, what are you going to do with my 20 bucks? He said, you're right, kid. He said, you're not getting cut. And so, yeah, I learned a long time ago. Key to selling, if you don't ask, you don't get. And, mm. and that, you know, there's my story. I could tell you a million stories about selling dresses in the garment center. That was one, that is one crazy business. Wow. Okay, so... 1970, 1973, when, when that's that? when I started. 1973. Okay. I lasted in that business until and... 1983. Then I went to work okay. for a small, I, I decided I couldn't stand it anymore. I was really good at hmm. it, but I was never going to be as great as I wanted to be because I just didn't like it enough to put in the time. Who? So who were you selling dresses to? That, I mean, those are bulk orders. Department so stores. Like smaller store. Mostly okay. Department, okay. Stores. department stores. You know, Macy's, Gim gotcha. most of them are out of Gimbel's. I mean, I can, you name me a city, I'll name you a department store. It's probably out of business. I sold all over the country. Hmm. And so you guys were dress we manufacturing? We like, dresses. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I did, okay. I so did that the, for 10 years and then said, I can't do this the rest of my life. I'll just either die of boredom or just kill myself so I, I i wanted to stay in sales got a job as the head of sales and man sales and marketing for a tr small training consulting company worked there two years tripled their business and in that time in that time and then decided as i'm going selling all these training seminars i'm sitting in the back of the room i'm watching i'm saying to myself that doesn't look very hard i can do that i bet you i'd be good at that hmm. i said you know what and if i could do that I could start my own business. I said, you know, I'm bringing in all the business. I'm getting the short end of the stick. I'm getting the short end of the cut. If I could do that, what the hell I need these guys for? So I quit and started my own company. That was 1986. Okay. And what was that? Well, that was my, that that's point. my speaking company. We call it, the name okay. of it was, well, the corporate name was Linro Incorporated, but I used to call it speaking of success. Because that's okay. what I spoke about, the success. I did a lot. Started out mostly right. doing sales training, then eventually evolved into keynote speeches. All right. So how did you get your customers well, for that business? Well, my first when sales you in that business, I had this great idea. Now it's 1986, so it's really no internet. Nobody's using the internet. Mm -hmm. Nothing's online. I said I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get into companies with salespeople so I can train them. So I decided I'm going to go to the help wanted section of the New York Times on Sundays. Because there's a separate section for sales help wanted. And I'm figuring if companies need sales or hiring salespeople, they're going to need to be trained. And the best thing about the help wanted ads, the sales help wanted ads, they gave you the phone number and they gave you the manager's name. So hmm. I would call up, okay. manager would answer That's the phone. Mean. And I'd and not answer the phone. Company, someone would answer the phone. I'd say, I'm calling to speak to, you know, Joe Smith. What's this in reference to? It's reference to the ad in the newspaper, in the Sunday Times. They put me right through. Get on the phone. I said, listen, yeah. I'm not looking for a job, but let me tell you what I do. I know you're hiring salespeople. I need to be trained. I can train your salespeople. We should get together. And I'd ask them for an appointment. We should get together. I was next Tuesday at 3. So I got an appointment with a guy from Metropolitan Life, sales manager of an agency in Brooklyn. And I went to meet him. I went into Brooklyn to meet him. I sat down with him, and I said, which I knew the answer. I don't ask a lot of questions unless I know the answer to them ahead of time. I said, I'm figuring you have sales meetings on Friday. Yeah. He said, well, you know, all our people have to pay for their own training. So I said, okay, that makes sense. And back then in the old agency system, life insurance agents were asked to pay for their own training. I said, this is what I'm going to do for you. 
He said, if you can get them to pay for it, you can come back and speak. I said, okay, you got Friday meetings, right? He said, yeah. I said, I'll come in Friday. I'll do 15 minutes. I said, then after 15 minutes, I'm going to pass a pad around and find out how many guys are interested. If I can get 20 guys to each give me $25, I said, I'll be back the next Friday and I'll do two hours for you. He said, okay. And that's what I do. I'd come in. I'd do 15 minutes. I used to do this routine where I'd take a dollar bill and a business card from everybody in the audience. They had no idea why. The whole exercise was they'd all give me money and never ask why. And I'd walk away with their money. And then I'd stop and I'd say, how would I get this? And they say, you asked. I said, that's it. You don't ask, you don't get. They'd all sign up for the next week. I'd come back the next Friday. And, and that's what happened here. I came back the next Friday. They gave me $500, most of it in cash, which is great. Don't tell the government that. And uh, yeah. I do my speeches. And then from there, it got easier because I'd say to the manager, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of MetLife life offices in, in this tri-state area. I said, you got three other friends who are managers who you could refer me to? And he gave me three other names from there. Then I'd start to hit the Prudential offices. And from there, then finally one guy at Prudential gives me a, uh, a directory. He gave me a freaking directory and he circled all the guys he knew who were managers and who I should call and use his name. Next thing I know, I'm all over New York, New Jersey and Connecticut. I get a call from Boston, from the vice president of the entire Northeast. He said, who the hell are you? I said, who the hell are you? He said, I'm vice president of the whole Northeast. My agencies are supposed to pay the Northeast office for training. He said, but they're giving you all their money. I said, maybe I'm better than you are. He's, I said, you know what? I'll fly up to Boston. Let's meet. I flew up to Boston. We met. He hired me to train every agency in the entire Northeast. And, and then from wow. there, my name got around. And next thing I know, I'm keynoting big insurance conference. So, you know, it, it, it's, it, you got to be a little creative and, and you got to ask for yeah. referrals, but you got to ask to begin with. So what, what led you to the idea for just taking their money? Like take the I'd one dollar in the business card. Years ago, that just, but I took okay. it to a whole new level. Uh, I did it in front of audiences <laughs> as big as three thousand people. I, wow. I was in Singapore. It was, was nineteen ninety one. I'm in Singapore. I got three thousand people in my audience. Now they have dollars. They're not U.S. dollars, but they're Singapore dollars. So I start uh-huh. off the my my keynote. I was keynoting this big. Uh, con- the Asia Pacific Life Insurance Congress. Three thousand people there from all over Southeast Asia. I said, everybody. Before we start, everybody take out a piece of paper, a business, uh, a business card, a piece of paper, a pencil, a business card, and a dollar bill. And they all do. I said, no, you know, no coins, no subway tokens, blah, blah, blah. And then I start speaking about 20 minutes. And I said, you know what? Before we talk about that, just pass up the business cards and the dollar bills. Now, I can't get to everybody fast enough, but I got people volunteering to help me. I said, you, you take the group on the right. You take the group on the left. You take the upper level there. You take the bottom level in the middle. And I'll just stand up here and you pile it in front of me. Well, they piled up thousands and thousands of dollars in front of me, and all because I asked. In fact, what I used to do was, after collecting a lot of money, I'd say, if you want it back, you can get it when I'm done. Please take your money back. I don't keep it. But if you don't want it back, we can give it to the charity of your choice. And in fact, we ended up buying a minivan for an orphanage with that money in Singapore. Oh, that's awesome. It it was, uh, it was, I, I, I used it all over the world. I did that thing all over the world. I, I did one where, where this was a great one. I, I walk into a room. It's a, it took place in Milwaukee. And the problem was I, would, I had been there before. Half the room had seen me speak before. Half the room had never seen me speak. The half the room that had seen me speak before, before they even sit down, they're whipping out dollar bills and business cards. Because they knew the routine. They knew they'd get it back. So they're already ready. They're whipping it out. The other half is looking at them. They're saying, that's... That's too easy. This must be a catch. So half the room stops. Half the room stops. I'm dead, man. So I decide, all right, let me try something. I walk up to the first guy. I say, you want in or out? He said, I want in. I said, give me a 20. Give me a $20 bill. I walked up to the next guy. I said, you want in or out? He said, I want in. I said, give me a 20. Give me another $20 bill. Went to the third guy. I said, in or out? He said, I'm out. I said, forget it. You know what, pal? You're out. He said, no, no, please. I walked away. He said, no, please come back. I want in. He gives me another 20. I had $60 extra. I had no idea what in or out meant either. But you got to ask. And and there was another good lesson because it just shows if you want to get bigger sales, you got to ask for bigger sales. I mean, the first time I ever spoke in the UK, I, I was doing uh, working with a promoter over there, and I, and I got on the phone with him, and I'm telling him what I'm going to do. It's around again around 1991, and 
I said, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everybody to take out a piece of paper, a pencil, a business card, and a one pound note, pass up the business cards and the one pound notes. He said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean I'm not? He said, you can't. I said, what do you mean I can't? This is my thing. I'm known all over the world for this. He said, no, no, you don't understand. We no longer have one pound notes. Oh, I wow. said, what do you have? He says, we got coins. I said, coins? My hands are small. What am I going to do with all these coins? I said, what's the next thing? He said, we got five pound notes. And now I got to decide. Do I have the guts? I did. So I asked him, everybody take out a five pound note. Let me tell you, Paris, I was getting fives, tens, twenties. One guy holds up a hundred pound note. He says, all I got is a hundred. I said, that's okay. Just give it to me. He gave it to me right in my hand. I had no <laughs> idea why I was asking for it. So it just proves if you don't ask, you don't get. And, and that's, you know, that's yeah. sales in a nutshell. You, there's, there's two things you got to do. You got to throw enough crap against the wall until something sticks and you got to ask. And if you, if you keep doing that, then you, you're going to, you're going to do fine. You know, the, the, the sales, the people that don't, that don't succeed in sales, don't talk to enough people. That's it. They just don't talk to enough people because they're afraid someone's going to say no. And, and, and the other lesson I would teach people is when I was taking the dollar bill, there was always people in the audience that wouldn't give me. So I just go right past them. I said, okay. And I just go to the next one. And I'd say, what did I do when people would not give me a dollar bill? They said, just kept moving on. I said, right. Because you don't argue with someone who's saying no, because all the time, if I was arguing with someone who wouldn't give me a dollar bill, it's all the time I'm losing when I just could have picked up dollar bills that were waiting for me. So you don't argue with people who are saying, just move on. Go to the next. It's a numbers game. That's good. So simple when you put it, it like is. that. Listen, it's not brain surgery. Oh. If it was, I wouldn't have been doing it. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about about you now. I mean, you're like a, a whole force of sales on your own, just as a person, your personality. Um, but let's back up. Um, as a kid, where'd you grow up, and did you have any sales experience, like you know, fundraisers, door to door type stuff that kids do sometimes? Not really. Not really. Okay. I, I, you know, I'd run a few baseball pools and stuff like that. And I always, I, okay. I, I was always pretty slick with my mouth, you know? Uh, I'm, yeah. I, as I said, when I played ball, I'm slow, but I'm small. And, and so, you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't outrun everybody. So, you know, I had, I had to be able to talk my way out of things. And I was really good at that. You know, as a friend of mine once said, he said, you're amazing at being able to convince people you're right, even when they absolutely positively know you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, um, I grew up in Brooklyn and okay. um, I always had a ability to get people to do what I wanted them to do for me. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I was that way. In co I got through college because I was a fast talker. I, I didn't get really? through college because I was trying very hard. I can tell you that. But, um, yeah. And, uh, well, I'd, listen, I... I was not a very good, I was determined to show, I had this plan to, that I could get through four years of school without going to summer school and never going extra, just, just four years period, no summer school and without doing a damn thing. And I did. And my hmm. guidance counselor once said to me in, in college, she said, you're never getting out of here. I said, what are you not? <laughs> I said, not only am I getting out of here, I'm getting out of here in four years and I'm not going to summer school because summer school goes against everything I believe in. <laughs> and uh, I did. I, I, in fact, yeah, yeah I, I, I learned how to game the system. I was really good at that. Yeah. You know, you know, it's funny. The only the only course I ever got an A in that I earned the A. other courses I got A's in. I, I once here's, here's a good story about asking. I, I took a course in educational psychology. I never showed up to class. I never bought the textbook uh, during the final exam. I just sat there drawing cartoons on the page as we're handing in our papers for the final exam. The, the professor said, I hear the professor saying, everybody, what do you think you deserve in this course? People are giving them answers. And my friend was in front of me. He was a nice guy, but he was dumb as a rock. And, and you know, he, he, he tried to be slick. Well, you know, I didn't work my hardest. I probably, you know, only deserve a C, got a C. Comes to me next. He said, what do you think you deserve in this course? I said, I think I deserve an A. He gave me an A. I mean, if he would have said no, what would I have done? I'd go for a B or a C. But I'm figuring, listen, if he's dumb enough to give it to me, I'm dumb enough to ask for it. So, I, you know, it, and uh, but the only course I ever earned the A was public speaking, which is kind of ironic because I had no okay. idea I would be in that business someday. And I, I just had a knack for it. I, was, I had no fear, never had yeah. any fear. 
and uh, the, prof the professor loved me. She even exempted me from the final. And uh, so, wow. but uh, this is always something I was good at. And when I found it, finally, uh, it, it was great. It was like, you know, the whole world opened up to me. It, it is, you know, there's nothing like really enjoying what you do. Yeah. For sure. If you don't love what you do, then find something else to do because then it becomes work. So when did you, so you started the speaking 1986. business? Okay. And then you're, you're training different insurance I was, companies. I was doing a lot of sales training courses. And then eventually I started to get asked to keynote big meetings. And so I switched my marketing and sales efforts towards keynote speaking. I like that a lot more. You know? So you say, you said keynote speaking. So describe what, what's the difference there? Okay. What is, your training seminar, what you, you come in, you, you usually get, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 people. A keynote speech is a big conference. You know how companies have big sales conferences. Okay. Or yeah, big yeah. incentive conferences. I, I I did a lot. Most of my most of my clients were either big corporations or big associations. Big associations have their annual members meetings. Uh, big companies have either a big sales meeting, a big management meeting, or if they sell through a dealer mm -hmm. network, they have a big dealer or distributors meeting. And that's what I did. I that's what I love the most. You fly in, you speak for anywhere from forty five minutes to an hour and a half, and you're out of there. And you're on stage. Wow. I love big audiences. I'm a ham. I love big audiences. The bigger <laughs> the audience, the better. I, I just love it. And, uh, you, you know, you can really, when you got a big audience, you can just blow the energy out of the building. And uh, I just love doing that. So that's what my business evolved into. And, you know, aside from books and other products. You know, I had audio cassettes at one time, audio cassette albums, I had videos, and then CDs, and then online products and stuff like that. Is that th are those things you were just launching like as soon as you got into the speaking well, business, or I how long? To, you that, that's document? another interesting first sale. The first product I ever made was an old video tape. You know, like a yeah, the old VHS, VHS tape. It was on telephone <laughs> prospecting. It was called Don't Count the Yeses, Count the Noes. I'm a big believer in getting hmm. more people to say, if you get more people to say no to you than anybody else does, you'll get more people to say yes. It's a numbers game. And so I approached okay. this insurance company up in Hartford. I forget which insurance company it was. And I said, listen, I've got this great program. I want to make a video cassette. I want to make a video out of it. But I can't afford to produce the video on my own. This is early in my career. I said, if you produce the video, I'll give you the master and you can use it, but you can only use it in house. I get the sub master and I'm allowed to sell it to the rest of the world. They said, great. Okay. So they took care of all the cost of productions, gave me a beautiful master from, for myself. And I started selling that video. In fact, that program is now, that program has evolved to the point where it's now on Udemy as an online video okay. program called supercharged prospecting. And so some awesome. super supercharged prospecting, prospect. it's on Udemy and uh, it sells okay. all over the world. I'm, I've got countries from, I got people from all over the world buying that program, but uh, yeah, so that was. Okay. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, 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 yeah, you got to be creative with these things sometimes. And that's how I got my first product. I got my next product <laughs> by uh, a, a, my promoter in England. He said, we got to approach one of these, uh, like a Nightingale Conant or back then with something called Dartnell. And he approached them in Chicago and they agreed to um, do me on audio cassette. So they made an audio cassette album. And then they, I said, you know, you should really do it live. I'm a live show. So they, they recorded it live in front of an audience in Chicago and then turned it into a five video series called Quest to Be the Best. It's old, you know. You know. But uh, it's amazing. Supercharged yeah. selling is still on. It's on audible.com as an ebook, as a, as an audio book. And, okay, yeah. and by the way, all my audio books, even the ones that I wrote that were in print, they're all recorded in my voice. I, that's when, when okay. I was approached to buy my, they approached me to buy my audio rights. I said, I'll only do it if you let me record it in my voice, because my stuff is me. Yeah. Yeah. When people... Yeah. Yeah, that makes it so right. much better. When people too, read my awesome. books, they hear my voice, even though it's in print. So I insisted on that. But uh, that that was fun too. So I enjoyed that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check those out.
Uh, and yeah, we'll put links to all those in the great, show notes. Thank you. That's sure great. You I appreciate it. Look those up and buy those books. So looking back at like the seventies, eighties, nineties, it seems like almost like a, like a golden age of that, like sales training right. and that kind of era. Cause you had like Zig Ziglar, right. like some of those Tony big Robbins names. And then eventually, then. yeah, Tony yeah. Robbins came yeah. up, I guess Dennis the nineties or whatever. Was big back then. Yeah. I ran into all these guys. And, and in fact, one of the reasons I left the dress business to go into the sales training business, but as a salesperson, was it was the early 80s and the economy was changing. It was changing over from a manufacturing based economy to a service based economy. And I figured with all these okay, new yeah. industries popping up, there's going to be all these new salespeople popping up. And sales training was going to become a very very important service and i was right sales training exploded during the eight started to explode during the 80s and i got in right at the right time so wow. and and it really did and now you know a lot of stuff's going online and i've done my share of uh yeah online stuff and i enjoy doing that too i'd rather be on stage in person but i enjoy doing that too yeah it definitely helps you get a whole lot of reach uh, what reach way more people than you could have in, in an individual no, no event, question even though about it. Totally no question energy. about it. Yeah. All right. So then eventually you got into the, the speakers hall right. of fame. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, I've been a member of the national speakers association and start, as soon as I started my business, I joined the national speakers association in 1986. Okay. Uh, if you want to, you know, succeed in the speaking business, it's a good organization to join, not because it's going to get you business. That's not the purpose. But you're going to be able to network with other people who are doing what you do and other people who have been successful in what you want to do. And so it's a right. unique opportunity to network and learn from people who have done or are doing what you yourself would love to do. And I got to meet a lot of people, good people in that business and learned a lot from them and uh, really helped me to grow my business and and, you know and become better at what I do. It's more, it's not so much about they're going to teach you how to be a better speaker, although there's some of that, but they're going to teach you how to succeed in a speaking business and a speaking and training business. And that's important because a lot Mm -hmm. of people can give a speech, but not a lot of people can run a business or succeed in business. You know, I can shake a tree. I could find 50 people who can give a speech, but I shake that tree and I find maybe a couple of people who can actually go out and get a client. It's a lot harder to get, you know, the toughest part of speaking is finding the client. You know, the easy part is doing the speech. I can fall out of bed. I can start, I can go right now and do three <laughs> hours for you. Yeah. That's good. All right. Now, somehow uh, along the way, you ended up with a minor league baseball Well, that team, was when I said. first started out. Yeah, I got involved in, okay. in starting a minor league baseball. That was a little bit ahead of my time. Minor league baseball has, I think, I thought it was going to explode and it has, but I got in and out pretty quick. I, I, I got into this league where they came up with an interesting idea. It was, it was a small league where they're going to have four teams in the Connecticut area and, um, but all play out of one ballpark. So there'd be no travel expenses because that's one of the biggest expenses for minor league baseball owners. You know, it was an independent league. We weren't, we weren't getting any major league affiliations, so we'd have to pay the players. Mm-hmm. And I made a good deal with, with the other owners. I said, listen, make, let me do the sales and marketing for the league. Let me promote it because that's my strength. And sure. they did. And while I was promoting it, I was going around the state of Connecticut talking to companies and, and organizations and whatnot. I was also promoting my speaking business. And, and the league oh, okay. did all right for a while, then went belly up. But when it went belly up, I went back to all these clients and said, remember me? You know, you... You bought ads in the program, <laughs> sponsorships and all that stuff. Well, you know, I do sales training. I got a ton of big clients. You know, I, I got uh, Southern New England Telephone, which was one of the baby bells at the time. I got I got wow. uh, one of the big banks in Connecticut. A number of companies in Connecticut hired me. I was doing so much business in Connecticut. I, I don't know how many miles I put on my car driving back and forth from Manhattan to Connecticut all the time. But, you know, you, you, you take lemons and you make lemonade, you, you know, you know some, yeah. some stuff doesn't work, but it leads to other things, you know, you know. and it did. I, I got I met a lot of people who became clients. And so the minor league baseball team was a fun thing to do. I walked away with money because they paid me to promote the league. So, and <laughs> um, and uh, I walked away with a ton of clients who made me even more money. 
So it was a good experience. And I love baseball. So, yeah. So that brings me to a question. I want to get your feedback on kind of this, the theory of how to get your first customers that I'm kind of learning and okay. developing as I'm doing this podcast. I'm talking to different people and trying to find patterns about how different entrepreneurs or salespeople or marketing people approach getting those first customers. And so far, I'll just tell you kind of my overall view and then love to get your feedback on it. So it seems like um, regardless of the type of business or the type of industry, the most successful people that I've seen, they build some kind of connection with their target audience that they're going to be selling to or that they, they would like to serve with their new business or their new job or whatever. And the ones that have that best connection, whether it's through physical events or even a, a social like online mm -hmm. connection or something, but it seems like those ones that have the, that spend the most time talking to their target audience have the, the most success getting those very first mm -hmm. sales because they've already built up relationships mm -hmm. beforehand instead of the first time the customer's seeing them is when they're asking them mm -hmm. for money, you know? Um, but I, I just like to hear kind of your thoughts on that idea of how important is it like defining your target audience? Oh, it's very important. Like, if, if you don't know what your customer is, what, how do you formulate a plan to sell them? You know, you just, you know, I, I've had, I, I do, you know, at, I'm retired now, but I do a lot of um, volunteer work. And one of the, I, I volunteer at two organizations. One of the organizations I volunteer at is an organization that helps people to start their own business. People who don't have a lot of money okay. and have no training to start and grow their own yeah, businesses. That's awesome. And, you know, so I work with these people. I not only counsel them, but I, I do some classes for them and whatever. <clears throat> and, I, you know, we go over, who's your customer? I said, well, anybody can buy my, my what I'm right. selling. Yeah, that's right. great. But how, how everybody's you, my how customer. Do you, how do you have a... How do you uh, put together a marketing plan, a sales plan for anybody? It's like if I said to you, Paris, you know, it's like when I when you ask for referrals, you ask for a specific amount of referrals. I always ask for three. I say, you know, I'll, I'll always say, you know, if I was selling to you, I'd say, do you know three other podcasters I could talk to who might be interested in my product? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's like if I said to you, Paris, can you name me everybody you know? You couldn't do that. I said, but could you name me your three best friends? That could you can do. It's the right. same thing when you're deciding who right. you could. Who's your, yes, anybody could buy it, but you can't sell to anybody. You can't sell to everybody. You need to find your niche. You need to find who you look. I started with life insurance companies, and that's who I targeted. Now, I didn't start making – there was no internet back then, so I wasn't doing social media, any of that. I'm a guy that picks up the phone and makes calls. Okay? And listen, don't, don't get me wrong. Social media, I think, is great. Social media is great. Email is great. But let me tell you something about social media and email. Social media and email are not selling. They're marketing. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference. Social media is great to find the people you need to sell to. But it's not selling. It's marketing. Now, a lot of people, a lot of salespeople love social media and love email. Why? Because you never actually hear someone say no. There's no rejection, but you rarely hear someone say yes. Now, if you you yeah. use the social media correctly and the email correctly, again, marketing, like I use my podcast and I use my blog, that was marketing. But once they got interested, you got to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. You know, I'll give you a great story. My father-in-law, may he rest in peace, he was a sales guy. I mean, he was a sales guy. He saw, he was, he, Charlie Romano called himself Charlie the glue guy. He sold glue, <laughs> but not airplane glue. He sold industrial adhesives. Okay. okay. Now, Charlie, he, Charlie died about five, six years ago. He was, he was 91 when he died. And wow. uh, even into his late eighties, he was still selling, but he would only sit, he lived on Long Island and he'd only work one day a week. Because yeah, he was in his eighties. He didn't. He had. He didn't need the money. He just liked doing it. Yeah. Now he'd only see customers on Long Island. He didn't want to drive too far. Now Charlie did not have a computer, which was good because he had no idea how to use one. Which means he also didn't have an email address. Now he had a cell phone, but it was a flip phone, and all he could do was make calls. Now Charlie worked on straight commission, working one day a week in his eighties with no technology, no social media, because social media was around at this time. 
mm-hmm. and just a flip phone. Charlie brought in about 100,000 in commissions in a year. Wow. Why? Because he talked to people. Because he had relationships yeah. with people. He'd go to a factory and he'd bring bagels and bagels and cream cheese for everybody on the factory floor. He, hmm. my, my sister-in-law works in the music business. He'd bring a box of CDs. You like this group? You like that group? And <laughs> he, he made relationships with every, everybody knew Charlie the glue guy. <clears throat> and he showed up. Showing up is 80% of success. So, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you don't, I, I'm telling you do social media and do email. But remember, it's marketing. It's not selling. Eventually, you got to talk to somebody. And let me tell you something. If That's you good. keep showing up and talking to people, you can sell in, no matter how hard or how good times are. I'm in, I, I, I have been hired for, by many companies to talk about selling during a recession. Because recessions, salespeople love recessions. And you know why salespeople love recessions? Because they're a great excuse to not have to sell. Because if your boss asks you, what the hell's Just going on? You haven't brought in any business. Well, you know, it's a recession yeah. out there. Nobody's buying. Don't you? Have you ever heard people say that? Nobody's buying? Oh, Nobody's yeah. Buying. I've probably the said gross that. National I know I've said The United States is $23 billion. If the, if the economy yeah. goes down by 1%, people are, are, are panicking in the streets, yet there'll still be $22 billion. Twenty-two trillion. I'm sorry. Twenty-two trillion dollars worth of business out there. Somebody's buying something. Yeah, I yeah. love selling in recessions. You know why? Because most of my competition has given up. Now, while there might not be as much business and the sales might not be as big, there's a lot less people going after those sales because those people are hiding in the coffee shop or the bar while I'm out there talking to people. And let me tell you something. I just had this conversation with my daughter yesterday. She started a sales job a little over a year ago, and I'm happy to say she's done extremely well. And I said, and she says, you know, it's tough. She's in the recruiting business and she works for a head. Okay, yeah. said, you know, people aren't hiring as much these days. I said, keep plugging in, keep doing what you're doing. I said, because you know why? Because yeah, if it gets worse, your competition is going to give up. But if you're still out there banging away at that phone and talking to people every day, you're going to get whatever business is out there. And, and, and I say to people, understand this. And this is what I told my daughter yesterday. When times are good and business is booming and your customers don't see you, you know what they assume? They assume you're busy. But if times are tough and your customers don't see you, you know what they assume? That you're gone. Mm. So showing up. Is, even, is always important. It's 80% of success, but showing up during tough times is even more important because they'll know you're around. And the people that keep showing up are the ones that are going to do the business. And if you keep doing business during a recession or a tough time, your business will grow even more when it turns around. And it always turns around. I've been through, since 1973, I've been through a lot of recessions. I started selling in a recession. I mean, the year I started selling in New York, the city was going broke. So... So, uh, you know, I've sold through many recessions. And, you know, if, if, you, if you keep going through those, you'll come out stronger because you've, you've created more relationships than your competition has because they're too busy hiding. They don't want to pick up the phone because they're convinced it's only going to be a complaint. And that's, there's my story. I'm getting fired up, man. I'm about to do a cold call live on the go. show here. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's huge, and that's it's so easy to fall into that these days of, you know, going on to LinkedIn or different social media and feeling like, hey, I put in a full day's work of it's sales, easy. and you haven't talked it's to one a person. Nice, easy, comfortable <laughs> rejection. You don't hear people yeah. deleting your email or not return, not replying to you on LinkedIn, but you still, you eventually got to talk to somebody. Eventually, you're going to have to talk to somebody. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's it. You talk to more people than anybody else and you'll do more business than anybody else. I knew a guy, he was, uh, it's a good model. he worked for uh, Metropolitan Life. Now this guy's probably dead by now because when I knew him, he was really old. And his name was Mady Fakazadi. <laughs> <laughs> this all sounds like movie characters. I met characters. this guy back in the 90s. At? He was an immigrant from <laughs> Iran. He came to this country in the 1950s. So I met him in the 90s. So you imagine how old he was then. Came yeah. to this country because he wanted to go to law school, but he needed money. 
So he got a job digging ditches. He really hated that. As he tells the story, says, you know, hot in the summertime, cold in the winter. I'm dying out here. It's terrible. So he's looking for another job. So he looks in the newspaper and he sees an ad for Metropolitan Life. It said MetLife, $200 a week. Now, back in the 50s, $200 a week was serious money. That was big time money. Uh, $100 a week was good money. This is $200 a week. So he goes to this MetLife office in New Jersey. He sits down with the manager and he says, listen, I don't want to sell insurance. He says, what do I got to do? I don't want to sell insurance. The guy says, you don't have to sell insurance. He said, really? I don't want to sell insurance. So, okay. He said, you don't have to tell, sell insurance. Here's what you do. Could you at least talk to people about insurance? He said, yeah, I could do that. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out every day. I want you to talk to people about life insurance. And if you can get 10 people to say no to you every single day, at the end of the week on Friday afternoon, come here and I'll give you a check for $200. He said, hold it a second. He said, you mean all I got to do is get people to say no to me? He said, yeah, he said, I can do that all day. He said, all right, go ahead and do it. <laughs> so as he tells the story, so I went out the first day and I talked to people about insurance and getting people to say no to me. And, and he said, I could never get to 10 because somebody would always ruin my day and say yes. <laughs> and this guy ended up the top, top agent in the world for Metropolitan Life. He made so much wow. money in commissions. He was making more money than the president of Metropolitan Life. All because he tried to get people to say no to him. And he couldn't do it because they kept saying yes. <laughs> Great story. That's an interesting way to do it, just to flip the logic That's on it. yourself. Try to get more. To kind if, of if, yourself out. I always tell people, and, and, and this, is, this is what I tell. I, I, one of my specialties is, is prospecting. And as you, I told you about my program on Udemy. But my thing yeah. is, my thing is, rejection sucks. Any, if, if any sure. sales trainer says to you, don't take it personally, it, it's not personal, just let it roll off your back, I guarantee you that's, that, that sales trainer has never sold a damn thing in their lives, okay? Rejection stinks. Listen, I was selling for 40, 50 years. I still slam down the phone and call somebody names. Why? Because I can't. <laughs> Rejection stinks. Yeah. You got to get it, though. You have to get it. Now, how do you handle rejection? Now, to me, the only way to handle rejection is to know how much rejection you need. In other words, if I know how many times I got to dial the phone in order to get to a decision maker on the, I don't mean a decision maker. How many decision makers do I got to speak to in order to get an appointment? How many appointments do I got to set and what's my cancellation rate that I can make a presentation? How many presentations do I have to make on average to get to a sale and what's my average sale put in my pocket? If I know that, then it becomes easy. Problem with most salespeople is if they did the numbers, if they knew the numbers, like for instance, if you found out that every two times you dialed the phone, you got to one person. Every five people you spoke to got you an appointment. Every four appointments, you got one can yeah, 25% cancellation range. So three people, you got one sale, let's say put thousand dollars in your pocket. So, you know, you do the math, you know, how many people you got to speak to, you know, one, uh, three times four, that's 20. That's, that's, you got to make at least, you know, 40 calls or whatever to make a 40 dials of the phone to make a sale. Uh, and, oh no. I, yeah. Okay. Whatever. I, I can't do the math in my head. I'm yeah. old, but, uh, gotcha. So if you know that, you know how many times you got to dial the phone in order to, you know, if I, if I know I want to make a hundred thousand dollars, I got to make a hundred sales, which means I got to make 300 presentations. I got to get 400 appointments. I got to speak to, you know, 2000 people. I make 4,000 calls, whatever it is. And you find out, yeah, I make 80 calls a week or whatever it becomes. That's how, you know, you know, if I know that if I make, let's say 14 telephone calls a day, just dials the phone a day, I'm going to get to where I want to be. When I'm done with 14, I, I reached my goal. See, it's it, it's it's not enough to have a sales goal. You got to have an activity goal, because activity right. drives sales. You know, mm -hmm. salespeople feel like they failed if they don't make a sale every day, even though they didn't have to make a sale every day. So if you don't have to make a sale every day, why feel like you failed on the days you didn't make a sale? But if you reach your activity goal on those days, you succeeded. So the whole yeah. thing is reach the activity goal on a daily basis. You can't tell me if you don't, if you reach your activity goal on a daily basis, you're not going to make sales. You've got to be a complete idiot if you can't make sales and you're reaching your activity goals on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, that, 
I guess that's a whole different discussion. Find it, making sure that you're the right person for this role. Right. Well, if you're hitting but, all the activity you know, goals it, and you're getting zero percent conversion rate. Yeah. That, but you know, there's well, something I've, else seen, going I've on. seen people who were idiots who did a lot of business because they made more calls than anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Um, so, all right. Activity goal focused. Um, okay. Yeah, that's right. I had a question. Go. You were saying that um, prospecting. It's huge. I'm involved with a couple different businesses. It's a big part of all of Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Trying to figure out how in the world do we, you know, figure out all right, who the target right. customer is. Once you figure that out, then who are they literally as real people and how do you actually get to them? Cause you mentioned like getting to the decision right. maker. Um, do you have any advice for getting through, you know, the gatekeepers? Well, the gatekeepers so are going to be tough to get through. Let's face it. Yeah. First, first thing is, cause that can burn up a lot of your calls. If you're just saying, I gotta make 14 calls well, and you talk okay. to 14. That's, gatekeepers. that's okay. Somebody will call you back. Okay. Gotcha. Somebody will call you back. You leave a message, but you leave name, rank, okay. and serial number. You okay. don't, you do not sell to the gatekeeper. The one thing you gotcha. don't do, you do not sell to the gatekeeper because what you've basically done is you've made the gatekeeper okay. your sales force and the gatekeeper is going in talking to his or her boss and saying like this, ah, some guy called, I forgot his name. I wrote it down, but he wanted to do this. I thought it sounded good, but I wasn't sure. So I, oh, that's yeah. what you get. So you just, so they're doing a worse version of your pitch. I, I want to speak to, I want to speak to Ms. Smith who's calling. Paris Vega from XYZ Corporation. What's this in reference to? They asked me, what's this in reference to? I'd say speakers for your conference. That's all. I'd say speakers for your conference. Yeah. And that's all. And that was it. And, and I, I, nothing was name, rank, and serial number, basically. If they call you, and people do call you back. You'd be surprised. People do call you back. But a good thing would be also to, you know, you go on social media and find out. You can find people too on social media. Then you figure out how do you contact them. Yeah. And so that that's what yeah. that's good for. You could also join organizations and clubs where the people, if you know who your client base is, go Make find them. the organizations yeah. and clubs they belong to and right. join one of them and get active yeah, and it's... get active in those organizations. Don't just go to networking night because that's like, you know, you might as well throw your, oh, your membership people. money down the drain. <laughs> it's just people trying to sell them life insurance. But what you want to do right. is all the salespeople you, come you want you want to join an organization. You want to get active in that organization. You want to be important in that organization. And then they start coming to you. You know, I, I did that with the National Speakers Association. Now, I didn't join it to get business. I joined it to learn how to build my speaking business. But I got very active in the National Speakers Association. Next thing I know, I'm on the board of directors of the National Board of Directors. And I'm doing big keynote speeches at their meetings. And my name is getting out there and business is coming through the National Speakers Association. So there you yeah. go. So you get, you know. I th yeah, that, that tactic of going around gatekeepers, because uh, this is something that's coming You can go around gatekeepers, way. call when they're, if you're looking for business owners, call yeah. early and late. Gatekeepers okay. work nine to five, business owners don't. You know, the, 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 right. the the standard line about owning your own business, I give all the young entrepreneurs, owning your own business is easy. You only have to work half a day. Problem is figuring out which 12 hours to work. <laughs> so business owners are in early yeah. and they're in late. Executives too, in right. early and late. Gatekeepers work nine to five. Yeah. You might want to call during lunch. Gatekeepers go out for lunch. A lot of business owners and a lot of executives eat at their desk. So, you know, try to call when they're not there. But what? But the biggest thing is, never sell to the gatekeeper. If you guys talk to the gatekeeper and get friendly with the gatekeeper, always be nice to the gatekeeper. Because the one thing yeah. here's here's the key to gatekeepers: gatekeepers can never, never, ever, ever, ever have the power to say yes, but they always have the power to say no. So right. the one thing it's you like don't want to do is be eliminated by the gatekeeper. And I think something that uh, maybe some younger salespeople run into that, that I've talked to is thinking that there's rules. And what I mean is like, they're thinking, okay, I have to go through this gatekeeper or whatever, but doing things like you said, finding out what a, a association or club or sport or whatever, the person you're trying to get to is involved with. There's nothing saying you can't go off hours and meet them at the thing they're going to the event 
whatever. Like use all your connections you or, or use whatever you can. You have. I once drove three, two yeah. and a half hours to an appointment. I get in there. Guy, I say like two words. The guy says, I'm the wrong person at this company. Drove two and a half hours. Now I could have turned, wow. turned around and gone back, but I didn't. You know what I said? Who's the right person? He told me the name. I said, you know, I said, yeah, does he work in this building? Yeah. Could you introduce me? Yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because sometimes the best thing that can happen is someone says no to you. Because once someone says no to you, they'll be more than happy to say yes to anything you ask as long as it doesn't cost them hmm. money. Okay. Great time to get a referral is when someone just turns you down. Say, listen, I understand our service or our product is not for everybody, but do you have uh, three people, or three other managers, you know, or three other business owners, you know, who you feel might benefit from our service? And that'd be more than because they feel bad. They said no. They'll be more than happy to give you the names and phone numbers because as long as it's not costing them any money. Well, this guy took me right down the hall to the right person. I'll give you another one. I was sitting in, in a sales call once with a guy. I was getting nowhere absolutely no way this guy was like a blank he was like i wanted to put a mirror under his nose to see if he was breathing <laughs> but the one thing you always do be observant i look all around the room i look at the pictures on the walls i look at the pictures on see if we can find some common ground and i noticed a garbage can in the corner and on it was those little basketball backboards with the little net yeah and it was a new york giants backboard and I'm a big Giants fan. I said, oh, you're a Giants fan. Yeah. I said, I have season tickets. And I did at the time. I said, I'd like to go to a game. <laughs> well, that opened up the whole thing. That was it. You yeah. got to be observant. That's why face-to-face -face is so good. That's why I love face-to-face. -face. If you can yeah. get face-to-face. -face, you're Listen, think about it. And, and I always use this analogy. If you were doing fundraising for an organization, and you wanted to get a $25 uh, donation or even a $50 donation. What do you do? You send out an email blast or you send out a postcard. Why? Because the market for that is huge. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people can afford $25, $50 donations. So you send out a postcard. Because if you get one half or 1% or even 1% return, that's fantastic. But now, what if you want to get $500 donations? You want to get $1,000 donations? You're going to send out a postcard? You're going to send out an email? The market for that is shrunk. You can't afford to get yeah. a half a percent don't, uh, return. So you start making phone calls. Why? Because you figure you got to get at least one out of 10 people to say yes. But what if you wanted to raise $50,000 donations? Well, you're going to send a postcard. I mean, the market for that's about this big. Send a postcard, an email, even yeah. a phone call. I mean, you can't afford to get 1% or 10% even. You got to get like 35 to 50%. So what do you do? You go knocking on doors. You go, you get on a plane, you do it, you fly to them and you right. get in front of people. So now you got to decide what kind of return do you want? Do you want a 1% return, a half percent return, a 10% return, or a 35 to 50% return? That will determine how you go and approach people. So, from your opinion, like the higher ticket, the sale, the more personal well, interaction course, it's going to take. Absolutely. That the sale, more time yeah. it's going to take, too. And face-to-face and -face never hurts. I mean, I've gotten on airplanes to do it. Yeah. It was worth it to me. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not doing enough of that. Because we're like, and this is probably a lot of companies these days, uh, depending on the industry you're in, like we're fully remote. Uh -huh. Sure. Like the projects I'm involved with. And, you know, pandemic and everything changed the game for a lot of people. They had to go remote. And... Like some companies, we just stayed that way. After and the that's fact, fine. I got like, no problem with that. Hey, we reduced office space. But it does affect things like sales and that kind of thing. Because if you get into that remote lifestyle, thinking that you can just do everything over email and video or whatever, it's still not as powerful not. as being in person. It's not. Yeah. It's depending on how important the sales is. I mean, you know, I, I um, back in 2000, it was. I, I was contracted to speak at the F Bridgestone Firestone annual dealers meeting. They have it every year wow. in Las Vegas. 3,000 independent tire dealers show up. And they hired me to do the meeting. And this was early in the year. They hired me for like, I think it was a November meeting. In the summer, I'm in Italy with my family, my, my, my wife and my two kids. We're in Italy. And I see this I, by the International Herald Tribune. There's an article about, I don't know if you remember, but remember the scandal Firestone went through when the tires started blowing up on the cars? 
I, I don't remember that. No. I see okay. this. Happening. Oh crap! What happened was <laughs> left rear tires were blowing up. Cars were rolling. Wow. The truck. They were rolling over. People getting killed. I said, "Oh crap! This mm. is this is just my. This is terrible." I said, "I'm going to get canceled out." So I get home from Italy. First thing I do is I call my client. Now the American headquarters is in Nashville. And I was living down here at the time. I'm in Durham, North Carolina. I was in Chapel Hill at the time. I said, John, am I, am I done? Am I out? He said, no, why? I said, what do you mean, why? <laughs> I said, look what's going on. I said, what, what, I, I, I was supposed to just speak for 15 minutes, just get him revved up and fired up. He said, no. Nah. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, just, you know, do the same thing. Oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> so I started to do my research. I flew to Nashville. And I started to really do detective work. And I talked to them. And let me tell you what happened. What happened was every tire that blew up was a left rear tire. Every one. Hmm. Every tire that blew up, every left rear tire that blew up was on a Ford Explorer. Every one. And every Ford Explorer that rolled over was in a very warm climate, Arizona, Mexico, so on and so on. So more okay. I'm, in, I, I'm researching this and talking to the people at Firestone and, and gathering stuff off the Internet. What happened was, now Firestone's been around a long time, back to Harvey Firestone in the early 1900s. Harvey Firestone and Henry Ford were like this. So Firestone and Ford always had a very close relationship. So when this broke, Ford approached Firestone and said, look, we're a lot bigger than you. We can handle the PR. Why don't you let us handle it for you? So they said, fine. So they handled it. And you know what they said to the media? It's not our fault. It's the tires. <laughs> and that just now at the time Firestone and still is it's Bridgestone Firestone it's owned by the Japanese well they went back crap crazy and they fired a lot of the top people of, of Firestone USA brought in a new guy real good guy real sharp guy and this guy decided we're going to fight back because as it turned out the problem wasn't the tires Ford Explorer had a rollover problem but instead of, right. I do instead remember of that fixing the rollover block. problem, they told people to underinflate the tires. Now, if you oh. underinflate tires in a hot climate, they expand. And yeah. boom, that's what happened. Because I guess you're supposed to get more traction right. if they're a little underinflated, right. so they're thinking that right. helps solve right. it. More, more base, let's say. Uh, it's a little flatter or whatever, yeah. but it, it expanded and blew up. So this guy said, we got to fight yeah. back, and that's what I decided to do. I decided we're going to fight back. And you got so I got up in front of the audience and I said, let me ask you a question. Who are the most full of crap people in the entire world? Are there many people more full of crap than the mainstream media? I said, no. I said, here's, and they did a great job, by the way. They returned, they, they took back and reimbursed people for millions of tires, like in, in like a couple of months. No questions asked. They were getting people returning sets of tires that had 50, 80,000 miles on them. Taking them wow. back, no questions asked. They did a great job. They did such a great job. It was written up in the Harvard Business Review. And so I got up there and I said, listen, folks, how many of you have clients out there who've been with you for 5, 10, 15, 20 years? They'll raise their hands. I said, how many of you have clients out there? They just walk in your store. They throw their keys on the counter and they leave because they know you'll take care of them. They'll raise their hands. I said, we know the story. You know the story. I know the story. We all know the real story. I said, but if you don't tell the story, who are your clients going to listen to? They're going to listen to the mainstream media. And the mainstream media doesn't care about truth. They care about sensationalism. They care about just the story. They care about selling newspapers and ratings on their TV news. I said, you tell your story. These people will trust you long before they trust the mainstream media. And if you don't want to tell your story, here's what I suggest you do. When you get home, go to the kitchen drawer, open it up, pull out the sharpest knife you got. Put it right over here and just move it right to the other side because you're cutting your throat. You might as well do it for real. The place went back crap crazy. They went nuts. It was, in fact, to this day, Firestone still says, we give you some credit for having them helping us turn this around and what happened was because of that i got hired by firestone on retainer basis to go all over u.s and canada and speak to all their dealer groups for the next couple wow. of years but and there's another lesson you don't tell people what they want to hear you tell them what they need to hear 
That's how you develop relationships. Because if you tell them what they want to hear, and what they want to hear is what, what, not what they need, the first thing they're going to figure out they don't need is you. Wow. So you got to constantly tell, in a sales situation, in, in deliveries, anything, you got to tell people what they need to hear. Now, I had a very good friend who was one of the great sales trainers of all time since passed away, unfortunately, too young. And he used to say, sell them what they need to hear, disguise this what they want to hear. Hmm. But I, I couldn't, I wasn't good enough to do it. I'd always just, I'd tell them what they need <laughs> to hear. And, and because I had, yeah. because I, I wanted to be back. If yeah. I give them, a, and for you to even figure out what that was, you had to fly to Nashville, listen, do all I that did research. All my research. You, got, you were heavily I, listen, invested. I did yeah. my research. If before the internet, I tell people, send me information on your company, send me information on your customers, send me all the information. I'd get stacks of information. I said I won't read every word, but I'll look through every piece of paper you send me. And when we got to the internet, I, I just give me your website. I'll go through every single page on your website. I will learn about your industry. I will learn about your business. The best compliment I could ever get, and I've gotten hundreds of thousands of standing ovations, and that's great. But the best compliment I get was when people you would come up to me and say, you sure you've never worked in this industry? Because that's, that means you did your homework. I think it's important to do your homework. I think it's always important to deliver more than you promised to. Yeah. And so that goes back to like the more valuable the sale is to you, put more effort Absolutely. into the home. I mean, you, you, know, the, person connection. you know, I would come up with, you know, I'd look at the website and I'd come up with phrases for their industry that nobody outside their industry would ever know. But I knew what to say. I would go to, if I went to a convention, to sp I was like speaking at a convention, I'd fly in the night before. I'd go to their reception the night before, even though nobody knew who I was at that point. I'd go the night before just to pick up stuff, get a feel for the audience. Do the do that yeah. extra bit, and even mm -hmm. if you know, usually after I was done, I had to fly out. But if I had some time to wait, I'd stay and have lunch with them. Why? Because now they know who I am. Now they like me, and yeah. and now's the time. I, yeah. It's easy to do new business. So you it, it, right. you got to do more than you're contracted for. You always got to give them more. Get more than the competition by doing more than the competition. Very, listen. Uh, I, you know what? You want to know how easy it is to beat the competition? When I would get to a venue, yeah. now I'm speaking at big conferences, don't forget. First thing I would do is when I get to my hotel room, I call them my, my client just to let them know I'm there. That's it. Just so that's one less thing. Hmm. You're putting on a big conference. You've got a million things to worry about. Just that's one less thing they have to worry about. The keynote speaker has arrived. Say, hi, just want to let you know I'm here. You don't know how many people thanked me so profusely. Hmm. I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, you know what? The, th the fact that they're thanking me so profusely tells me something, that I'm one of the few people that's doing that. Come on, it's common yeah. courtesy. But these are the little things that you can do to beat out your competition. It's easy to beat out the competition. Most people are just not willing to do, you know. It, 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 goes, it goes beyond being a salesperson. You've got to be an expert, an advisor, a resource, and a single point of contact. That's it. Just remember ears, E-A-R-S. What's that? Expert, advisor, resource, and single point of contact. Oh, okay. Most salespeople, they're just product and price pushers. Yeah. But you you want to sell price? That's great. You're the easiest guy for me to, to beat out because somebody's eventually going to come along. You know, but if you're selling quality service, convenience, and value, if you're selling – if you're being an expert advisor or resource in a single point of contact who's selling quality service and convenience and value, if you're selling save me time, make my life easier, I mean, you sell digital marketing. You're there to save them time yeah. and make their lives easier. And you're selling right. them knowledge, expertise, information, and education. If you can sell those 10 things, they don't care what your price is because go find someone else willing to do that. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. It's interesting the the EARS thing that you said, it, it lines up like almost exactly with what Google is trying to do. Like they're changing their algorithm oh, really? or whatever to where the way they rank websites is based more on experience, expertise, authority, mm -hmm. trust. Or it's EAT, they okay. call it. It's, or it's EEAT. It's like experience, expertise, authority, and trust. And they have these guidelines where people at Google have to go through websites and rank manually do you think this 
website lines up with our wow, EIT standards. That's great. And then that that kind of influences where people right. rank. And that's now. important. And so that this yeah, and it's age. it's trying to humanize. Yeah, trying to humanize the search right. results to make it right. more accurate. Right. And uh, it's a similar kind of thing, I guess, with any relationship. If you if somebody has more authority, if you trust sure, them more, they have more expertise, yeah, you're going to do more business with them. Yeah. Interesting. Warren, this has been oh, amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so My much pleasure. for being on the show. Um, why don't we wrap it up with you? Um, let people know what books, the names of your books, and uh, where they can find your different Products and well, you can online. find my, my two books that are in print are called The Best Damn Sales Book Ever, 16 Rock Solid Rules for Achieving Sales Success, <clears throat> and The Best Damn Management Book Ever, Nine Keys to Creating Self-Motivated High Achievers. So Best Damn Sales Book Ever, Best Damn Management Book Ever, you can find them easily on Amazon. Now, those two books are also audio books on audible.com, along with four other audio books. And let me see if I can even remember them. One is supercharged selling. <laughs> one is supercharged goal setting. One is on time management. And I can't remember what the same one is. <laughs> hey, I'm 71 years old. Give me a break. <laughs> but, uh, but they could search your uh, Warren Gresh's author name on Audible. And just search Warren Gresh's, and it'll give them a list yeah. of all my audio books. Also, go to Udemy. U-D-E-M-Y. You can find my prospecting program called Supercharged Prospecting. And you'll find that on Udemy. That's been a very successful program for Udemy. And uh, so that's where all my stuff is. I do not have a website. You can find my YouTube page also. Just plug in Warren Gresh's. I still have a YouTube page. And you can see I've, I've got about, I don't know, I haven't done a video on there in more than a decade. But there's about 50, 60 videos on there easily. Short ones mostly. Of, of me, uh, uh, okay. if you if you want to see it, and so there's, there's plenty of places yeah. to find me, and uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I really enjoyed this, Paris. We should do this again. Definitely, thank you so My much. My pleasure. And everybody, look up Warren stuff, buy it, get better at sales, get those customers. Appreciate it.